presentations this morning, but LTE is uh, doing uh, good ant duties, and uh, LPGA is going to be here next month. Uh, they had something conflict, so we'll start straight up with Keith. Maintenance. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, just in a general report, we're getting, we've completed all of our pre emerge application on the golf course, which is ideal before this rain. It's forecast, uh, just so everybody knows, they're talking hmm, somewhere around 11 inches over the next 10, 11 days, which is spread out. If we're lucky, that would be excellent. Uh, wouldn't cause us any problems. But we've got all that work done. We've got a lot of the stumps out of here at this golf course. We have a few more to do, and then we'll go to uh, work at Highlands on some of the big blowers. Some of them we've hauled out. Some of them we've dug a hole, buried them upside down. Some of them we put them back in the hole, cut them off, and ground them. So we've done a little bit of everything to, to get those out of there. So it's been a long process, but we're, we will get it completed before the uh, summer gets here would be my guess, weather permitting. Uh, we have greens verification starting <laughs> next week. It's supposed to be dogwood. It's going to be a bit of a challenge, I think, because it's a chance of rain every day. So we are going to do some deep drill. This is our program that we started a couple years ago where we do two golf courses rotating every year early with a deep drill, which is the machine that drills holes down to 12 inches, fills the holes with sand, that helps us get better overall infiltration through the layer that develops from the conventional aerification at the four or four and a half inches. And then we do conventional aerification in conjunction with that. So if the weather turns out kind of bad, we've got a plan that we have some greens at dogwood that are issues, some fronts, some things like that. So we're going to do those areas with the drill and fill first. And then we'll, we've also bought smaller tines than the normal ones to pull plugs for our conventional reason we did that because if it rains a lot we can't get those plugs picked up so if we use smaller ones we still will get some air down there and pull out those cores and after the summer but we can drag that in and blow it off so we'll we'll do whatever we can during the weather we have the whole week so with any luck this might be the first one I, you know we have a lot of crazy weather here but I've been here since April I started the first thing we did was verify we've never missed one this may be the one that gets us right here because this one's looking pretty broad. So when you say you go, you do two, you do them back to back, or do you we like do the every we other do one? the drill and fill. If if the weather wasn't an issue, we do the drill and fill first. So that pulls out that core, a one inch hole, fills that hole with sand. So that so firms them. That's a one inch hole. That fills with sand, and when you do that, it firms the surface up so much that you don't have to worry about coming back with a conventional machine and making ruts. So then we come back over with a conventional machine. Like, like the next day or the next week? Or the During that week okay. is what we do. We'll go right behind it. What we'll do, we'll do two or three in a day, then we'll do the other one so we know where we're at. Uh, so, uh, and, it, it, and the other thing on the smaller one, the advantage is, you know, on the drill and fill, they're six inches apart. And then we come back in with the smaller ones that are like an inch and three quarters apart so that you get the center areas. What's really interesting, someday if you're around when we're doing the drill and fill, we take uh, marking flags, like the little white wire flags that you see, you know, uh, that they use. Before you do the drill and fill, you try to push that flag in, and it's hard to get in at all. Then you hit this layer at about four inches where you really have to force it. As soon as you run that drill and fill across there, that flag just even in the middle. Just it, it does what it's supposed to do. Uh, and, the, and the advantage of the sand in those core holes is in that sand in a bigger hole allows that water all year. We have old greens here. That's why I'm not as concerned about uh, dogwood because our newer greens. But the older greens that we have here, then that, if we do it every other year, it keeps us, keeps us uh, going better with healthy turf in between on that off year and it's, it's work for us. So. Dogwood's the first one. That's next week. The week after that's Kingswood this year. Then, by doing them early, those heal up before we go to our next aerification on the other golf courses, which is in April. So what we've done by doing this is it gives the golfers three golf courses that don't have holes in it. In the past, all six of them were aerified the same week. So now you have some options. You have those two plus the Scottsdale course, which we don't aerify till summer. So you have three golf courses you can play that don't have holes, uh, it's, you know, because you've got 
four weeks to five weeks in between because our conventional stuff starts I think the 16th of, of April and those golf courses will be uh, Bella Vista Country Club uh, Highlands and then we're going to do the front nine at Burksdale too because we have time to do that and that will help us maybe be able to keep those greens the same as they've been in the past even though we're going to do a little less mowing so that would it will help us there as well I'm no can't get the equipment up there that's the biggest problem and you can't get the sand dry enough to drag it into the holes so that makes it worse for the golfers uh, you get aggravated when your ball picks up sand as it rolls across there the advantage of the drilling field is you it goes straight in the hole however when that auger it's an auger is what it is and it pulls it out and you get these piles so you still have material on the top so there's still going to be some sand there no matter what a good inch rain is perfect because it finish washes it in but if it's happening while we're trying to do it it's challenging the, the machine that you use uh, drills the hole 12 inches it fills it with sand at the same time and right after it drills it has, it, has, it's got a bin on top so as the drill comes out Sand goes in through a tube and fills the hole. And so, and, and then it picks up the, the core. Doesn't pick up, no. That's what we have to do. That's so the why core comes ready. afterwards, you go sweep the green with it? Well, when we do the conventional, then we have the cores and we take a core harvester on one of our so the, bigger tracks. So the first pass doesn't make a core? It drills a hole and pulls out sand. Okay. But that we just end up brushing in. Okay. The conventional one pulls out a core with a plug like you see. Right which is the second part of this verification. So basically you're re regenerating the, what you pulled out, grinding up, putting it back down? On the first part, all we're trying to do is get a column of sand. Right. And, and it, the fracturing effect loosens it. The conventional one is where we want to pull out X amount of organic material. We have tests that we run every year. The recommendation is how much organic matter needs to be removed per cubic yard of material. So. We do the holes, we do the size of the core, the hollow, and the spacing to match up with our total percent of organic that we need to pull out. And then that is picked up and hauled off. <clears throat> so it's a, it, and that, the conventional one happens twice a year. On the Bermuda course, it will happen three times this year, May, end of May, July, and August. And the reason for that is because of the way those greens were reestablished, where we had to just, we sprigged back on top of existing you want to be sure you get that layer broke up from that construction. So that's why that will be done three times. First time with bigger tines, second two times with smaller ones, they heal up pretty quick. So it, it'll be, well, it's minimal to me. It's not to a golfer, I understand that. But again, then when that's going on, you have that week, you can play the bentgrass courses and stay off those holes if you want. So that's the advantage of having two different kinds of turf, if you, if you think about it. Someday, if you had another Bermuda course, maybe you got the disadvantage in the winter and you got the advantage in the summer and during airification. So it's a, it's a balancing act, basically. Um, so that is where we are there. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the construction going on at Kingswood. You see that road going across. Uh, it's going behind Fort Green in between some T's, so we had to shorten the hole. But uh, originally, that is the bike trail. They're putting a large arch bridge over there to the left for the bikes originally they were going to bring all that stuff in by the bathroom and drive all the way down that side well reed said no we have a better option than that they come in by the maintenance facility and then there's a road between those two holes that is really a maintenance road that they're using which was in bad shape which when they're done they were going to put back like new for one and then we went between the tees and not in front of a green, so the only uh, disruption is a shorter hole, which most people like, <laughs> I would say. And if we had a tournament, we could stop them one day and you could play the, the back tee. So they tell me that is supposed to be done the end of April. I think that's a bit optimistic, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Where is the bike trail going once it comes over the bridge? Is it going through the, where the woods are? It's in the woods, between the creek and the woods, on that left side of five. And then it's going to cut behind five green, go by the bathroom, under the bridge to uh, where Rogers is now. And that connects the back 40 to this section. That's what that's doing. 
So think about that for a second. You might have a question about that, but that's common. Have There's something. a small bridge over there that you really don't even notice by T.H. Rodgers. You don't really even notice that you're going over a bridge, and so the path will go under, will go through where that where that bridge is. That's okay. where that small little creek comes through. Yeah, it? exactly. Yeah. It's like a culvert. <laughs> yes, yeah. where all that gravel that gets deposited yeah. in between there. That's where it comes from. So yeah. that path, as it rains, will have gravel on it on occasion. They put concrete in there. We saw that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's ready to go. So will this will the bike trail when it crosses the cart? Uh, the golf course it's going to be behind by the bathrooms at six or is it okay so it's not going to interfere with any play golf play at all it's not going to cross in front of play there'll be intersections there where you go from hole to hole and they're going to have their own path they're not going to use ours and they also had talked about putting up some split rail fence and stuff to be able to separate so when a biker comes through he knows for sure what his trail is and doesn't get onto an asphalt cart trail that was the discussion we had a year and a half ago. Okay, thank you. Is is there will be crossing though, right? I mean, the golf the course. golf carts and the bikes at some point <clears throat> need to cross each other, so we just need to watch it just, for yes, traffic. There will be signage put up there. So going from five green to six T, and coming from fourteen green to fifteen, t, no sixteen T, fifteen green, they'll be going in that area between there. So it's a transition. It won't interfere with play, but it will be carts and bikes could intersect, will see each other there. If you, if you look at where they're, right, when they, they have that storage bin up there, well, it's a storage trailer. Um, and if you look at from the, uh, going from the bathroom towards Little Sugar Creek, and you can see uh, the cart path is here, and they're kind of going in that little swale and you can see where it's starting to, you know, they're, they're driving their vehicle back and forth. They're following the path that, that the bikes will go. So they're, they're already kind of blazing the trail. Uh, one other thing I needed in the general report that I kind of forgot. Um, last year, for those of you that remember the USGA report, the issues we had with turf on a couple of holes here at Bella Vista Country Club due to shade. We were able to keep uh, some money in for some tree work on number 11 on the right side, which has been done. We cut those up, give some more sunlight there. And then we also did work on number three. That area on three was terrible. And we had one big tree blow down over there, which was really kind of a plus for us probably. So we trimmed those trees and you see about four or five areas that have been prepared to sod along with an area on 18. Yeah, that, that, those areas we have a truckload of sod delivered today, and they will be trying to get that sod out before the rain, in between the rains. So we're putting out uh, one semi-load of sod, basically, that we were able to put in the project. And this was recommended, the tree work was recommended by the USGA to help us with the turf, and we're using uh, one of the newer turfs uh, that's out of Oklahoma State that's cold tolerant, a little more shade tolerant. So we're going to try it in those spots. It's not latitude. It's another one above that. It's called Tahoma is the name of it. We're trying it. The latitude works really good in the full sun and better in the shade. This one on the rankings is better than latitude in shade. It's still Bermuda grass. It still needs sun, but it'll do better. And then Rob will keep those areas roped off probably most of the year where we'll go around uh, so that it has a chance to establish because basically those holes unfortunately are rock from all the years of flooding so we want to give that turf a chance but everywhere we put the newer turfs they perform well so we feel this is kind of a test for future should we decide to redo fairways because it can be sprigged it doesn't have to be sodded so it would be more economical to, to redo <coughs> golf courses with those grasses down the road what's that doing apt just ground under repair it, they APT. may not APT. need it as ground under repair when we get here we'll see they'll make that decision yes. keith one other question since you're talking about residing on kingswood hole number three and 17 the red tea boxes have been moved back to the whites are you thinking about maybe reciting those tee boxes? No, ma'am. They've just uh, had some other work going on 
that they're trying to get them to come back. We don't have any money for sod in, at Kingswood. Can you take the sod from any of the old tea boxes at Burksdale that were not are no if longer in use? If we need to, we have used some of that in the past. We could do that again. Okay. <clears throat> and Burksdale, uh, I read in the article, I think that was on the paper or the uh, flyer about the mowing height. And it, it, it read to me, and I, and I don't think I read it right, but it read to me like we're going to mow the greens and fairways at the same height. Uh, I mean, I said, she does, didn't do, didn't get it accurate. Okay. Let me just say that. What we're going to do is we're going to be mowing those as close to the height as it was this year that we can with less uh, inputs. We probably will mow less often. So they won't be quite the quality. But again, as I said, with the airification we're doing, uh, it, it's not going to be an instantaneous change. I don't anticipate on greens we're going to see a lot of difference other than maybe speed a little bit. No sooner than the end of the year, one season, other than just totally ignoring it, it's not going to change it. Where you will see the change will be fairways and roughs because they'll get mowed less frequently, so they will be taller. The, the rough will be a little lower because we're trying to cut it a little lower. The fairway will be higher because we're trying to do it all with one machine <laughs> is the goal. It's going to be a middle somewhere. We don't know exactly where, and the reason we're doing that is because one of the ways to save money at Burksdale was to not hire any seasonal employees so we have no seasonal employees so we only have x amount of people per hours to mow so we're going to have to play with that a little bit as we go i i, I think it's going to be fine i don't know exactly how it's going to work so we'll see how it goes are we still on target for april 1st weather permitting obviously but yes good all right the last thing uh, i have is the bridge update We'll do the uh, Burksdale removal first. Uh, as I think everybody knows, the sanitary sewer line is removed and under the creek and operational. Our irrigation line is ability is to be turned off so when the bridge is ready to come down, there's no holdups there. Uh, all, all permitting has been addressed. Uh, the city worked with our engineer a little bit and gave us a, a little bit of an easier time on one of the permits for the Burksdale Bridge. So they're ready to do that. They're putting together the documents that will have to be sent to contractors on how the work will happen, where they can access, what they have to do with the stuff they take out, all of that. Uh, so they'll be ready and they think, and, and we use Burns McDonald for this one, not Kraft and Toll. And the reason we did that is because they're the ones that did our hydrology study. And the hydrology study needed some certificates through that. So since they had the work done, uh, it was easier and less expensive to do it that way. They're telling me on their timeline, uh, weather permitting again, by the end of May, we should have that bridge removed. Uh, Scottsdale, they haven't got the final drawings to me, but they're close on what they're going to do to stabilize. Uh, those two bridges. It's interesting. I think I need to say it again because yesterday at the uh, coffee and questions uh, I was asked again, well, what are, are we going to lose any of the bridges and the railings? So it, it, we talk about bridge repair and it's not truly a bridge repair. The bridges are fine. It's the abutments they sit on and the banks around that are being stabilized. So I need to be sure I'm clear on that. The work is not related to the bridge structure itself. It's the support of the structure. And once they get that information to us, they will take that out to bid also uh, to meet our requirements of three bids and get started with that. Permits there are also all taken care of and handled. Uh, and that may be as late as middle of June before we're finished with those, uh, depending on if they can get in there and do the work and how quickly we can get a contractor on site. Because the concern that I had, and it's been shared with me, with the both engineers, these projects are so small in the scope of things, not to us, but to other people on the road work and stuff that's going on around here to get a contractor to come out and mess around with, for example, 18 bridge for 70000 Well, actually, it's only 35000 to take it out. That costs them money sometimes. So the challenge will be to get three good bids probably. So that's my report on the bridges. Thanks, Keith. Daryl. 
All right, we're going to move on to, um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming to the expo last night. We had a good turnout, golf group leaders, I spoke to all of them, very happy, got some sign-ups, which was great, festivities were good, um, went a little longer than last year, which was great, got all the way just before seven, where last year it was an hour and everybody bolted out. So I want to thank everybody for being there, and I want to thank the group leaders as well. I think it's a good thing for the season, to kick off the season for the groups. Um, moving on to financials real quick, we're going to start off with the uh, green fees. If we have a look there for February, just over um, half a million. One thing I really, really like to put in there is positive. Um, member rounds, member revenue is up 5,600. Um, annuals are trailing a little bit, and the main reason why is people um, were waiting for the fee schedule to turn out. Um, to get changed in March, and Carmen have seen, has seen a spike in that, which is great. We go down to cart revenue for February, uh, two, 296,000. Uh, daily cart fees is up by just under 10,000. Private carts and CDs are trading. Once again, it's for the fee structure and the change in March 1st. Guest screen fees, 25,000, is up by 7,971. That is just January and February, which is fantastic. Um, as well as merchandise revenue is up over last year by 4,000. Positive signs, like to hear it going up. Uh, we look at our rounds report, um, 9,424. We are up over last year, just short of 1,000 rounds. I do have a typo, um, I got happy with my zeros in there. Uh, member rounds are 8,874, not 80,000. Kind of wish it was January, February, 80,000. So there's a typo there. But we are up on our member rounds by 378. And then non-member, just like last year, trading up at uh, 549,000. So I mean, 549. There on, on the rounds, uh, January and February, we had a number of days which we couldn't play because of the weather. It uh, was uh, how, how was that affected? I mean, it affected obviously the play, but if we had more rounds or more days, we would have been up a lot more. Ten. The revenue of the 533, how does that compare to year to date last year? 533, if you go on to your next page, if you turn your next page, Gary, you'll actually see where we're trading. Um, it actually has it broken down a little bit, but you'll have a look at our annuals as where it's hurting. On that other page, turn over, sir. No, you've got it. Just, it's double-sided. There we go. So if you have a look at that, and that's what we do. I'll just do a summary on that first page. If you want to dive in, you can have a look, and you can see um, where our, our members' green fees are up, like I said, and you have a look at our annual green fees are down because everyone's kind of waiting on that side, but it's spiked at the end. And then you also got to take into effect that the different price structure with the um, fees coming in and dropping, that's where it balances out. But always we include this, so if you want to dive into it, you can see the breakdown on that side. Um, and then for your second um, question, or your first question there, Gary, is if you turn over behind the actual round report, Tammy did a fantastic job and kind of broke down um, on the graph side, per course, including winter closings and days we are able to play with the weather, made a lot cleaner look. Thank you, Tammy. Um, so you can kind of see the days that we were forcefully closed, that we had to close down. If we had rain, Gary, we did have people that would show up and play later when, the, like today, it rained this morning. We got people out there this afternoon and we're rolling. But that'll get a summary and we'll keep continuing on that. Rounds are still up. What we found, and Alex will vouch for this, is um, during the week was a little slow. Rain Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, cold weather Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we were slammed, which is great. So as you can see, our guest rounds have spiked a little bit. Find a lot of guests are coming in on Saturdays and Sundays and enjoying what we have here, which is great. Um, so a couple comments I think I think the member green fees that I mean we have a lot of golfers that we golf with where their annual had expired mm -hmm. in January and they did not renew yet so actually they were paying daily green fees so that may be some of the increase in daily little bit, mm -hmm. it's little bit not, of not necessarily is is a whole bunch more people coming so yeah. the other thing is as we go forward any comparison to last year's numbers is a false comparison 
-hmm. So is it possible that we can compare to our budget? You know, wh where, where are we to what our budget is? Because our budget takes into account the difference in the pricing. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, it's going to look like all year we're yeah. way behind yeah. because we're 20 percent, collecting 20 percent right. per round more. So okay. your rounds will still be, that's the comparable round, the dollar, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Number of rounds would be a right. better. Oh, well, yeah. not really, because again, you're comparing rounds of twenty percent less money. No, so no, it's no, don't 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 use yeah. the money. Just use the just use the rounds. rounds. Well, I, I think yeah. the money's important. I would yeah. really like to see a comparison to our what our plan is. Do you have any idea how many annual green fees were were uh, sold in January, February, as opposed to what we expected? January and February were down. Right trading quite a bit and i'll be honest this last week since Carmen the price change we haven't really bugged her because she's had people in front of her the whole time so i don't know where we stand to date we have our meeting tomorrow and we'll find out more on that side interesting numbers Brittany's rounds are up over 100 rounds which is 148 to 257 which is cool so we could do an over and under here and start a little game um, <laughs> so march 1st uh i asked paul gomez out there the supervisor to pull Brittany's rounds um from march 1st to the march 9th of last year and put on this year and we did 38 um, rounds last year in 2019 at Brittany. Year to date on March 9th, we were at 276. So um, what's really good, he tells the story of people coming in, getting their activity cards, walking over, getting two drinks, getting some bruts, going and playing nine holes with Brittany and coming back. So all in one day while they do it, especially, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool deal. So we'll see how we utilize that. And um, one thing I do, I want to make a statement is when we play Brittany, um, we've got enough carts over there and it's all been formulated correctly, but I am encouraging our membership to pair up um, at all the golf courses as the season spikes off, rather having singles and carts, let's all pair up and go, and especially at Brittany. You know, we don't want four carts on Brittany going around in a foursome and then we get short on dogwood. So let's pair up as we can, as best we can. Remember, we lease a seat, not the cart. So we want to make sure we do that. I'm just asking membership to do that. It would help out. Um, we do our best. Our starters do a good job and as best they can. Um, moving on, let's uh, jump on to something that's not on your schedule. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Bruce and his crew. Uh, Mary has brought to our attention last year um, the bathrooms on, on Country Club with the floor and the ceiling in there. And due to budget restraints, we haven't got where we want to go, um, do all the updates on it. Um, but we were sitting down there and we thought, okay, let's get in there and power spray the bathrooms. So we went down there, it's our two weeks closing. We power sprayed it, hit it hard with stuff. Uh, went back the next day and it looks exactly like it was before we power sprayed it. So it's not working. Then Bruce um, said, I've got a guy that works on my crew that um, used to be in concrete work. That's what he did. He owned his own business. So I said, get him in. Let's visit. So we pulled him in, and we visited. And, and this, this shows the community we have here. This guy works for us part-time or two days a week. Um, and Mike Murray turned around and goes, I've got some leftover product in my garage. Why don't we go down there and we try something different? Because I don't have the money for it in our budget. So he went down there yesterday. Broke it up, sanded it down, put some stuff on there, changed the color of it to, a, to kind of like this table color, real seal, resealed it, and I went and looked at it um, this morning. Ran down there real quick and I looked, and what a job. It's zero cost. This is, this is the people we have around here. It's really cool. So shout out to Bruce and his crew at Country Club. If this works, we're going to look at, look at doing it elsewhere. I want to see how it goes through the summer. You put some granular down so you wouldn't slip. Um, pretty educated guy and just retired and he enjoyed it yesterday. He got them all done what in one day. Mike, what? Mike Murray. Very impressed. So shout out to that. That's not on the, on the agenda. Um, moving on to the second thing is Golf Fest. Golf Fest is next month, uh, April 11th from 10 to 3. I always have a challenge. We'll get back to the challenge here in a minute. But my challenge for the month of April is it's volunteer month. We've got lots going on. Uh, Ruth also asked me to ask you, she was, she was at our expo last night, is one, we need volunteers for Golf Fest. 
I want to keep it within this group. Spoke to Leslie. We don't want too many volunteers. We want to get people that are involved, like we did last year, help out with check-in and helping the, the, um, each vendor um, to get through it. We've got five vendors coming. It's one of our big events. We had another company, uh, another location down the road in Faithful canceled their demo day because of ours, because ours is growing and everyone talks about it, so it's pretty cool. So that's one volunteer, and the other volunteers for the APT. All the forms will be in the pro shops um, Friday. We did some last night, but we did a little, going to change it up a little bit. So if you can, get your groups, get your members, get everybody you know um, to sign up for the APT as well. That's a volunteer form for everybody. But the Gold Fest is for us, if you can. So yes. I, I had a thought last night. Is it possible to do something like a Google form or a web page for volunteer sign up? And that way the groups can simply put that on their websites and so it's just a click and sign up instead of having to do a form? I'll get with Ruth because she runs that. Um, I'll get with her. I'll be happy to help her set it up. It just goes right to an Excel spreadsheet. Right. And it, take, it would take about 20 minutes to set it up. And you can do a waiver form on the back there that they've got an initial and sign that can be... Yeah, we'll, we'll have to figure that out, okay. uh, how to do that. That's the most I might important. need some help on that. Maybe if they sign up, it's a key yeah, signature it, with a check box. You just type your name in with a check box. We, we can make it one. Usually. If you sign up, <coughs> you also agree to the terms and conditions. You know, just like when you, you know, accept a, a license on a software product, you say, I accept it. You just accept it. You didn't have to sign it. You just yeah, it. I think there's a way to do it. But it, it, I'm just thinking how, we, how can we simplify the process and make it easier for people to... Uh, to respond without having Ruth to be at a whole bunch of meetings and all that kind of thing this year. Yep, I'll visit with her. I know she, I'll visit with her and go from there. So that, jump, that's jump my in, challenge. Jump in real quick. On, on Golf Fest, uh, I've got a sign up sheet here. Uh, we're going to do like we do normally 9 to 12, uh, 12 to 3. So split. So after we're done, we'll spin it around. And if you want to work on both, then that's great too. Darrell, last night you made a statement about how full our golf courses are? Yes. Like 87, was that the figure, 87? Yeah, so what I did, I did a yield analysis for um, optimum tee times, and that's where people, we look at our, Alex and I were talking, and the pros are talking, we were looking at optimum tee times in summer. Summer <laughs> program is from seven o'clock to the last tee time around 12.30. You know, if you go at three o'clock in the afternoon when it's 95 degrees, that's not optimum tea time, playing time. So if you take our average uh, optimum tea time and Monday through Friday is when I calculate it, not weekends, Monday through Friday, that's when our group play, plays. And that's why I said at the meeting last night, we had 87% full with groups. And that's fantastic. I mean, that just shows that our groups, our membership are playing during the week and there's small groups and everything. And that's, that's big. So it is crucial. And I told the group leaders that we asked them to turn their numbers in four days prior, not the names, the numbers. So you have um, 12 tee times in your group. Today we're only going to use 10. And that's needed to know four days out. Why? Because I've got their buddies playing on that course and that, and that shotgun just down the road. And he's got someone who didn't sign up late and he's looking to get another tee time or two and then we do a balancing act for those four days. The pros do a great job um, balancing it out, making sure everybody can get on and keeping everybody happy. Um, so with that 87% full during prime time during the week, um, really we need our groups to do a good job, and they do do a good job. I'm not saying they don't. I'm just making everybody aware that let's all help each other out, get a balance, and we look at 28 foursomes and every shotgun during summer as best we can. And is Let's there a specific it. number of uh, shotguns you're going to try to have on each course during the summer? Um, it changes day to day. We've got heavy days like a Monday, Wednesday is a big day, uh, Thursday. So what we try to do is we keep group plays also regular tee times mm -hmm. too. We've got some groups that require regular tee times. So we'll have literally two to three courses we'll have a shotgun on. At one course we'll have a um, regular tee time day. And then we also have a morning of maintenance going on. So between that, it's a, it's a big balancing puzzle to put it all together. Um, and the groups have been good. We got it out early. Kelly got everything out to the groups early. We've made some adjustments on the groups that said, well, we've, we've played Highlands too many times. It's a tough course. We'll try somebody else, so we shove them around. Nothing against Alex. 
but it's it's a good call. So that that's kind of what we do. It's it's a big juggling act, and I get we don't make everybody happy, but it's we do as best we can. And I'm, last night everybody was pretty happy with the group. So well, I like that eighty-seven percent is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I would su suggest that's probably a lot better than most public courses are doing. That's so and I realize we still got a lot of vacancies out there in the afternoon, but. 87%, that means our group play hasn't slacked off too much, and I think most of us agree group play drives membership play in Bella Vista, so I'm, I'm impressed with that. So hey, just, just to reiterate on that, sorry, uh, is, and that's what I said last night in our group leader meeting, we unique. Uh, Bella Vista is really a unique place, and you can go down to other places, and they're looking for weak play. They, they're begging. They've got, that's where their specials are. That's where the $20, $25 specials are. We busy. And we're rolling, and that's what brings people to Bella Vista. Our groups, groups are up from 116 last year to 125 this year, groups. And a lot of the groups have expanded, just like last night. One of the group leaders came up to me and said, man, for the last few years, I've got two to four people. He says, tonight I've got ten. He goes, this is great. So now I've got to call the golf ops and get another tee time. So we do adjustments now for the next week, trying to make it balance again. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing um, moving puzzle they keep changing the pieces on us and then the, and then the way that comes into effect too so what are the hours of operation for the summer of the of the pro shop pro shop would be um six, six to six six to six okay so what happens you know at six o'clock when the pro shop's closed you still have in the summertime you have two to three hours of daylight you could play mm -hmm. uh have you given any thought one of the one of the uh, the comments was for increasing rounds was to have a punch card that the because the, the cart guy is going to be there waiting for carts to come back in probably after six o'clock that he can just you know, if you go on and you want to play you get a punch card like we used to have with the range okay. and the, the, the cart guy can just punch it and go so at last month's meeting when we were talking about how to increase rounds Gary you weren't here um, we talked about we'll be looking at those hours of operation two years ago um, we came in um, my position, this position last year um, or two years ago, they cut back the okay. hours. We used to stay open a little longer. We just weren't getting the play in summer. Um, with the new free structure, we realized we might have some extra play, and all the pros have looked at it. Um, a little worried about the punch cards because my card guy can be out on, the car, out on the course looking for cards, putting up water, picking the range now at Highland, Scottsdale. So if we need to adjust and we're going to look at that, an extra 30 minutes, you're ready three hours at 6 o'clock. So it's normally two hours, 8 o'clock, 8.30. So everybody wants to play nine holes. They won't come in and pay and just play three holes and be done. So 6.30 we've really looked. I put it into the budget, kind of look to see if we need to go a little later. And we all adjust according to the daylight and see what we got going on. That was discussed. There was the other idea of, of a, a nine-hole annual fee, or an after five o'clock uh, annual fee that you could that you could buy. Personally, I like to go up and hit balls like at five, six o'clock, and then and play three or four holes going home. If you had an an, an annual fee, a nine-hole annual fee, I would probably pay my green fee when I played during the week at regular hours, and buy a nine-hole annual fee just so I can go out and play three holes on the way home. So it's just, just an idea that we You know, uh, we've basically taken our, apart our entire fee schedule and put it back together for this year. And, and we, need a, we need an entire year to see how it goes. And that's not just for golf, that's for everything. Uh, and we've been very honest with the number of rates that we've changed, we're gonna get hopefully a lot of it right and we're gonna get a couple wrong. Uh, and we'll have to make adjustments, not to the rates because those are locked in for three years, but we'll have to make adjustments, you know, you know, so you, you can see that when, when Alex and Daryl are talking about, you know, what about the hours this summer, are we going to have to make adjustments? Because this is a whole new playing field. It's, it's totally different this year. Um, so, you know, I would encourage everybody to, look, you, you got to give us a season to see how the new rate structure works. Uh, before we start making additional changes. That's good, but I'm still going to pursue it with you. <laughs> so I'm not going to drop the idea. I think no, there's, la there's some so good last there. month, last month, and you weren't here, we, we got all, we pulled everything in, and I said that we will visit, go through it all, look at all our revenue, 
and we will we will look at everything in detail with the pros and look at basic money and everything like that and see what we can do. Any questions, other questions for me? Thank you. Okay. Um, all of our tournaments are online and ready for registration. You can go to the BOA golf tab, click on the tournament tab, and you'll see everything listed, all information, all registration, all out there and ready to go. We've been seeing sign-ups for tournaments in July and September already, so it seems to be working. People are getting their yearly calendar all set for us. Um, our first tournament was February the 15th, our Sweetheart Open. We had 22 teams. That's up from zero teams in 2019 because we had a little bit of poor weather, but uh, 22 we were pretty happy with. It was a fairly cool day. We might have gotten a couple more, but anytime we can play golf in February, we're fairly happy with that. Um, the next on the schedule is the three-person scramble, which is uh, the end of March at Highlands, March the 28th and 29th. That's a Saturday and Sunday. Uh, currently, we've got 25 teams signed up for that, so we expect it to be pretty full, especially if the weather cooperates with us. Um, the Shot in the Dark tournament comes right after that. That is at Highlands on Friday, April the 17th. We're already about half capacity for that event. Um, we have a very limited sign-up availability for that because it's just a nine-hole course that we're trying to fill up. So maximum is 18 teams, and we're already about eight or nine. So I would encourage anyone that wants to play in that fun event to go ahead and get that in as soon as possible. That's a four-person scramble, yes with glow golf and all that kind of stuff. We'll light up the flag. We'll give everybody glow golf balls and glow necklaces and glow things to put on your golf carts. No one runs into each other, but it's a, uh, it's a good time. We only had maybe one or two driving to a bunker last year, something one. like that. Uh, just, one. Just, just one. Yeah. Correction, just one. Just one, okay. <laughs> that just was one. very just one. safe. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we set up the course to where you can see your way around pretty well. But it will fill up, so if anybody wants to play in that, get that sign up for him in as soon as possible. Alex, one, one yeah. quick comment. It's more fun sometimes to stand on the deck of your house and listen to the comments. <laughs> oh, yeah. You meant to that, too. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a lot of local folks around there hooting and hollering and having a good time with us. So. And some, some voices are recognized. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. You're not pointing any fingers it had to be It had to be somebody else who lives in my house, not me. <laughs> Um, other than that, we've got the, uh, the two-man summer series information just came out. We've already started taking a couple of sign-out forms for them. We gave this away a lot at the uh, Golf Expo last night. And what this is, it's not an actual tournament. It's just an extra event that we put on our calendar. It's a two-man match play bracket. We've got different brackets for different tee divisions. So we'll have a blue tee, a white tee, and a red tee. Um, the opponents will all make their own matches, so we'll give everybody one month to play a match. You'll contact your opponents. You'll set up your own tee time. We will tell you which course that you have to play for a match. So take, for instance, the first round matches all take place at Dogwood. Um, the first day you could play would be May the 1st, and you've got until May 31st to play your match. We'll give you all the information to contact your opponents. You'll reach out to them, make your own tee times and then go play your match. We'll leave your scorecards with all the appropriate dots and all that kind of thing and your rules at each golf course. Let's see the question coming. Will that be online where we can go see the brackets and the winners and losers? And we yeah, we're going to put that on the website. We'll get okay. the uh, tournament page to have something like that. We may have to okay. do a little different page for it, working with Kim and her team on it. As far as the, the preparing the scorecards, do you need to know in advance when it's going to be so you can have the scorecard ready or it will be? I will be sending the scorecards to the course that you're required to play that month. So the first round match will be at Dogwood. On the 1st of May, Dogwood will have everybody's match scorecards. Okay. So when you make your times and you go to check in, you'll pick up your scorecard and rule sheet and go play your match. They won't be dotted, though. I'm sorry? They won't be dotted with... Uh, oh, they'll be dotted. Yeah, it's all, it's all with net scores. So, so basically the handicap will be as... Your handicap where you play in the match will be 1. as of May the 1st. Okay. It won't change throughout the month. And then the double elimination... Mm -hmm. You know, if you lose your first match, you'll be the second match. You'll be you'll go into in a, a losers bracket, a different bracket. Sure. And then, do those brackets play at the end? Or? No. If you're in the losers bracket, you're fighting for third place overall. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. First and second will be the final matches of okay. the winners bracket. Got it. Not a true, true double elimination. Yeah. 
Alex, I just want to get clear on the handicap system because that is new this year because it is live and the USJ suggests a percentage of your handicap to be used. Mm -hmm. We're using 80% of handicap, which is pretty standard USGA match play rec recommendations. 80% of the index or 80% of the course handicap? Course handicap. Course handicap from the tees that you're playing. Okay. It's a little complicated, a little wordy. I know I'll have to explain it out to pretty well everybody that signs up, especially since it is so new. But um, if anybody has any questions or comments on it, you can always reach me, and I'll be happy to lead you through that. Any other questions for me? Okay. Thanks, Alex. Good stuff. Tom? Yeah, just a quick report. Uh, I spoke with Carmen at the end of the day on Monday. Uh, through March 1st, uh, she has sold 1,250 activity cards. Uh, which is uh, really very strong, 1,250. Uh, of that, 500, she estimates, are brand new, people that have never had awesome. a photo ID card before. Uh, we'll, get the, uh, we'll get the exact numbers uh, in the coming weeks. Right now, we're just trying to get out of Carmen's way because she's so busy. Uh, we don't need to be bogging her down with uh, reports. Uh, she needs to take care of the customers in front of her. Um, the first, uh, first entire week, she had four people on phones, and they couldn't keep up. We we're getting so many calls. Uh, so they are just, they've just been very, very busy. We have a number of volunteers that have been helping us out. The Welcome Center here because uh, we've repositioned staff to, to give uh, Carmen additional help, and even the additional help um, was barely enough. Uh, so we're very busy. Um, Have you thought about automating any of the application process the, the, online? It, it already is. You can sign up for your, uh, for your activity card online. Okay, so you just, and just go in and pick it up, or they mail it to you? They mail it to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also, of the people that are signing up, a large number are families. So it's clear that we're going to have a lot of uh, kids at the pools this summer, uh, at the beach, and so forth. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, I encourage everybody to uh, attend either in person or uh, uh, live stream uh, the Meet the Candidates, which is next uh, Tuesday, the 17th at 6 p.m. at Reardon Hall or on our Facebook page. Uh, 6 p.m. at Reardon Hall, the 17th, and uh, uh, we encourage everybody to, we, we have uh, six candidates running for three openings, and uh, all I ask is you make an informed decision. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, attend that meeting or uh, in some way, shape, or form. And we do have a candidate, Ms. Yeah. Sins, back there. Thank you for joining us again, Janet. It, and Mr. Brandenburg over there, good to see you. Is there going to be a bios put out in the, in the papers? Bios are already available on the website, on our webpage. If you go under Member Resources, you can click on the top and it will show the uh, candidate information. We have their candidate profiles and uh, they've done videos. Um, and um, uh, Jan, five minute videos, do we limit to? Yes, most of them are like two minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, photos, you know, we, we have it very structured and organized so that uh, it's, it's even throughout, you know, every candidate has an even shot. Thanks, Tom. That's it. Thanks. Board? Wilson? Chair? David? Nothing? Anybody from the crowd? No? Moving along then, old business yardage posts. Mr. Darrell. That was, that was a challenge I asked the committee uh, last month to get out, visit with the groups, look at golf courses with the 200, 150, 100 yardage markers. Um, I'm ready for feedback. Has anybody come up with anything, spoken to anybody? And um, let's, let's write them down. I've talked to um, a lot of the members and my husband has talked to a lot of the members that he plays with and most of them are in favor of leaving the <coughs> posts in um, yes a lot of people have GPS but about I know about half the women I talk to do not use GPS and rely on the sightage of the, the yard markers 
So I think it's important that we really consider that. Okay, that's good. That's this is what I want to know. And any ideas? I, you know, could we do something different? But that's that's good. And Tom and Tom and Mary plan a bunch of groups during the week, so that's important. That's what I wanted to know. The, well, <clears throat> the feedback I've received is is the markers, the yardage markers aren't that bad. Uh, the only other recommendation was to, uh, if you take the yardage markers down, put it on the put an indication on the cart path so when they get off their cart they can do it, but you can't see that from out in the fairway. So my preference is I don't have any problem with the yardage markers myself, uh, but I don't really rely on them very much. I use uh, my range finder. Yes. Sorry, go so ahead. The, the feedback I've gotten is very similar to what Mary has. If you have um, m many of the men use the range finders religiously, Fewer of the women do. I mean, some do, but not in the kind of in the mid to lower um, or the higher handicap people. Um, I did do some looking. There are some other kinds of markers. We might, I mean, the one thing about our markers is they do look a little dated. Okay. Um, compared to if you go to some of the other courses that have gotten new updates. Okay. But there are quite a few different choices. Um, that can be made. And actually, Paul Gomez turned me on to, um, they have some that you can just mow right over, right? So you don't have to, to uh, um, take them out, right? Or there are also some that are discs or other things. So I, I gathered a few things here. Um, and then the other thing um, that I, and if, if we do decide to remove or change them, I would suggest maybe we do a course at a time so people can ease into it and also have a sale on range finders. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> in the weeks before uh, for people, because the cost of range finders are really coming down, plus a lot of people are, can use their phones now. Uh, so that the, the situation has changed over the last five years. For sure. Okay. Um, I also found kind of a cool little thing to design your own yardage book. So if we do take them away, maybe we can do a little a yardage book like the the pros have we we actually had those and i know that, you have some for the the we had two, yeah two of our locations we had them and um we put that fee up front and we didn't sell but anything. yeah i mean so, so anyway so there's a website that has a free template on it so <laughs> yeah. um anyway so this is yeah. kind of my I'll, i think i made enough for most everybody so those are some of the ideas about different kinds of uh, uh Things with maintenance in mind. Awesome, Daryl. Have we shortened down all those mar those yardage markers? Have we shortened all those down now, or are some of them still the original height? Uh, they've come down over age uh, during the winter projects. Keith guys pull them in. Uh, what happens is, in the base of that, it rotten, gets rotten out. So they cut it and they bring it down. They repaint it, put the yellows and stuff on mm -hmm. them. They just keep cleaning them up. Yes, and some have come down. Highlands is one of them has come down. I actually like them shorter. Um, I think there's more visual appealing to the eye than these big things sticking out of the ground mm -hmm. I, I went to one of the golf courses that had them in the middle of the fairways and that just drives me nuts I'll be honest you see these big poles in the middle of the fairways but that's my personal opinion okay we do cut them down and next year would be our year that we might replace them if we put it in the budget and that's the advantage even though they do look if they look native uh, it's something simple for us to do we just buy the four by fours and cut them and we do all that work ourselves uh, one that you mentioned, the runover one, I have used those before, and there are some challenges with that. One, they stay down, and two, they have popped back up and uh, caused some damage to mowers. Because mm -hmm. we mow our roughs with rotary mowers. Those are made for real mowers. If you run over one of those with a rotary mower, nobody's going to be happy, including my mechanic. So we can take that off the list. <laughs> Well, my, my question, and Mary and Susan both, um, do in, in your conversations, do we need all three? Or can we go down to just 150 and then mark cart pass for 200 or 100? Or is it, or, and then that's just an idea, but, or is it all three, the 200, 150, and, and 100? Well, I think for most women I talk to, the 100 yard one is probably more important than the 200 yard one. Because to them, it really makes a difference how far you are from 100 yards uh, on which club you're going to use. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just a pitching wedge. Right. 
Interesting. When you're at 200 yards for most women, you're going to hit whatever you got. I you mean, hit you're seven not iron. Gonna Don't get lie there. to me. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about the idea of only one side, like the side opposite a carpet? I think as long as they're visible right. from the – I hate the ones that are just marked on the cart path because when you're out in the fairway, you can't see those, right. you know. And, and so if you have them at least on one side, you have visibility and you can gauge, you know. What about yeah, us that, that, that cuts my maintenance cost and that would cut it in half. Yeah, yeah one side I don't think is, is a problem. And uh, I think that uh, in as far as the maintenance of them, is this not something that the uh, the friends of the Highland or the Dogwood or can take as a project to keep them cleaned up and, and done? The the taking the taking care of them is not a big deal. We just do it in the off season. I was uh, trying to get filled and some work. What about? I got an idea. Sorry, I'm going to jump in on this one. To Key's point, and that and that's where it comes down to his maintenance crew and, and everybody getting the mows cut out there and, and going. What happens? Just not here. If we trot at Highlands, if we do one side for three months, like we moved some tee boxes around and tried them at, you know, at Scottsdale, we tried hitting from that side, and then we polled everybody that came through. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Because taking them out, Keith, is you just pull them out the ground. So I know if we ask Greg to go down and make a decision, and we, can we take them out near the car path on the side? Because they humps anyway. You, on some of them, you can't even see them. If you're driving down the car path, but you can see those ones on the far side, if we take all these out, we just run a, a month starting April, and we'll see what everybody says. As they come in, Drew's out there, Alex is out there, and go, guys, what do you think about that? And then we'll get input, and we go from there. You could also mark, you could also put a yardage marker on the cart path. Like you said, you know, you could mark it 100 yards close on the cart path and, and leave the marker on the other side, so you've accomplished both. Okay, I actually spoke to somebody that did that. Um, they actually put little little poles on the car path. I'm talking paint. Just paint. paint. Yeah. Just paint it. Yeah. yeah like a uh, if you're going to do that, I'd rather just leave the pole because painting on that asphalt yeah. is yeah. a constant problem, and then it wears off, and then we already have so much stuff painted on the car path. Uh, so you know, to put it on asphalt and then get it to match the numbers when we have to come back and repaint it sounds easy enough. But it doesn't look very good, so I would I would rather deal with the post than paint anything on the car path. Also, on the car path, where I was going with that too, it's further away from the fairway, so you're 200 yards from the car path, and your ball could be 10 paces off, could be 80, 180 yards, because some of them are so far apart. <laughs> because that's you know, <laughs> I'm lucky to get in a fairway. <laughs> David, All right. you chime in on any of this? What they're doing in other courses? You see all kinds of things around the country. The, the one, my favorite marker on, the, on a cart path is the little brass thing that says 200, 150, or 100. I don't, have no idea what the cost of that is. But if you were going to do something on the path, that's what you would do. And I see that a lot. It's very, very common. Instead of painting on the path, instead of posts. Posts on one side, maybe that. Uh, so that's, that's the, probably the most popular thing I've seen. I don't, I don't really care whether we have markers or not. I'm like most of the guys out there. I use my range finder and, uh, and look at it. And I'm getting to the point where, you know, when I get out of 200 yards, it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> but, you know, it, uh, you, we talk about when we have two or three. Um, if, if you have carts on path and you're going to go walk out to your ball, you might want to like to know if you're between the 150 and the 200. You might not know you're 172 or whatever until you get out there. Mm -hmm. But it, your selection of clubs that you're going to take out with you yeah. can be determined just by the visual of uh, a five and a six iron. In. I don't think I've ever seen a golf course that just has one yardage marker. You know, you almost always see 200, 150, and 100. I can't think of any other situation where I've seen less than that. <laughs> and I think, somebody, I think people just want something visual. There's a lot of people that don't use, you know, range finders or they don't try to get that precise. You know, a lot of them use the little handheld GPSs, and that's uh, and a lot of times just a little bit of a guess. So I would think anything that's visual, and if you took them off of one side and either put some plaques out or anything like that, I don't think a lot of people would notice that only one side has the yardage markers. I agree. It would yeah. be interesting to take them out of the high ones and not tell anybody yeah. <laughs> see if they notice. I honestly don't think a lot of people would notice. As long as there's one for a yeah. visual reference, 
they're going to be able to kind of choose and see their yardage that way. Yeah. So can we make a little vote for this committee to recommend to try it at Highlands as a sample? I know Greg would probably have him up by the time the end of this meeting. I'll second that. I think Highlands would be a great place to try it because we have more walkout on Highlands than any course we've got. I mean, we have you, you, have, you have to stay on card pass. So that would be a really good place to start. That's and then you'd find out. What was that Off motion the again, Gary? Side, yeah. And I second that, sir. All in favor? Cool. Hang on, just, we, sorry. Quick, just a quick One, comment there. Yep. When you when you take that out by the path, the golfer can still see where that post used to be, and he'll know that it was the 200, the 150, or 100. True. Now, at some point, if it if it does work, you may want to take that concrete out. Oh, we would do that. At some point, we but until you know, up until that point, they're going to know anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good Agreed. Point. Good point. Uh, yeah, Phil. One one question. Are we going to shorten the post that we have on the opposite side of the cart path to okay. something reasonable? We're going to leave it where it is. Now, can we also put a little paint or a little something on the cart path at the same distance, 200, 150, besides the post on the other side? I, I, I can. I don't see a point in it though. As long as you got that cement there, you probably wouldn't need it, would you, till the cement leaves? Not right now. Probably. Well, right now it's going to be gone soon though. They'll take it out. Well, Not can, if it works. If you wanted, if we decided to do that, you can just get a little disc and put it mm -hmm. next to the cart path as opposed yeah. to painting on the cart path and color code the disc. And so yeah, when you get out of the cart, you can see it. Like what, da like what David said, at a point, if we find that this is a different way to go and it works with Keith's crew and we, we do one side, I agree with Keith in the painting because they've got to go back for the um, – for the gold tees and they got to repaint that and after a month and a half that paint doesn't look good um, on the car pass at a point we could look at a little a disc in the ground and actually cement it into the car path at a point later down the road if this is where we want to go with it that could be a budgeted item or a friends of correct the, uh, the or friends, actually or the friends of highland to discuss like the pack one. we would put That's something cool. out in the 200, 150, 100 by the cart path. Okay. If we go decide what to put. So, yeah, we could look at that. If this works, you get a little Mr. Mulligan plaque and you can cement it in so they don't have to repaint it. That would probably be something moving forward. I like that idea. All right. Yeah. Um, just, just a comment on that. I, I think I agree with Keith and. And I think we all need to be cognizant that this is still a really tight budget year. And it's little things like that that over time, they start to add up to real money. And so we need to be cognizant of these, these little things that aren't really budgeted or planned for. All right. Cool. Thank you for everybody yep. and awesome. the feedback. I appreciate it. This is what's important. Remember the new challenge this is a volunteer month as well, so APT and Golf Fest. Jason. Speaking of, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead, Gary. Speaking of APT, I'm in charge of the uh, housing program again this year, and I'm, I'm going to be sending out invites to all the old Put us people, in again. as well as anybody else on the committee that would like to volunteer their house for a player or two. I'll be sending a, uh, an invite out to you as well. If you haven't you, you, done that, it is it is an absolute. Of course, we had somebody we knew, but yeah. it's a blast because the kids came over and we watched hockey. Wasn't it hockey that we watched? It was the Blues, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it was a blast. The well, kids had a blast. Yeah, we've had, a good time. We, we've done it for three years now, and and these guys are they're very they're very nice. Yep. They're humble. They are very appreciative, you know. And we've taken them out fishing and on the on the boats, and we have you know dinners every night for them. You know, we don't have yep. to do that. Yep. But they really appreciate it. These guys don't make a lot of money. If you can save them a, a hotel fee from having to pay 500 bucks for the week, oh, they're really time. appreciative of it. So I think you'll find it rewarding as well as uh, beneficial to them. Yeah. So I'll send that out. There's been a couple that have 
followed throughout their rest of their career. One of them just qualified for the Asia Tour, right? Ian? Yeah, um, long story short, fresh out of college. First tournament was uh, right here, and he got fifth. Um, he speaks funny like me. He's from South Africa, so I got to know him a little bit. He can't um, catch a fish either. Right? He can't fish either. <laughs> but um, long story short, he missed Q school by one shot and had to fly back home to South Africa because his visa's up. So he reached out to me the other day, and his only route to get back on tour um, was to go the Asia route, and he qualified last, two weeks ago for the Asian tour, got his tour card for the Asian tour. So he's doing the Asian tour, which bleeds into the Canadian tour, which Canadian tour will give sponsorship for the Corn Ferry tour, and then it can drop down. So he's doing a whole world tour around to get back to where he wants to be is playing over here in America. But that's the relationships you build from these yep. tours and people that, that host him. Um, the people who live down here that hosted the end have been following him as well. And they, when he came through to play in the Wichita Open, he stopped and he stayed with them one night and then carried on through. So you build friendship, you breed. Ian Snayman. Yeah, so it's a kind of cool story, but good stuff. So thanks, and Gary, thanks for doing that. That's that's a, another scheduling nightmare, I'm sure. Uh, as Miss Mary reminded me, and I appreciate that. We need to uh, look at the handicap flag flag program. We postponed it until the end of this month, uh, or extended it until the end of this month, and we need to make a decision to vote to carry forward. Um, which I'm assuming we probably all want to do, but we need to make a vote to make it official uh, to going forward. So any discussion, comments, questions on the current handicap We need a motion. Program? I'll make a motion that we extend it. I think it's a good program. A second. Any discussion? And we've still working on the, or have got the, the transition from here. Or is that working out okay? So the transition, I'll tell you a couple of little things. So anybody watching at home and, and on Facebook and the minutes and later on, um, the transition from Bella Vista, because it's a long walk, is working out good. They're not all using it, but we do have three or four that really appreciate it and have commended the staff. It works out really good. Uh, we're dropping, we take the cards across in. They can drop their flags and bring it over. Uh, that works out good. Uh, the other thing that I want to make, wait, if we make this motion, and please put in the motion, that we won't reissue cards. They don't need to come in. If they have a current, because they're over the age of 80 or they're disabled um, and they need help, they don't need to come in and get new cards with a date on it. Let's just roll on with this program as we roll it out. If anybody turns 80 this month or this year that needs a card, come on in and we'll issue new cards from there. Otherwise, we have a, we have a people coming in just to get cars cost money and all that type of stuff so that would be in the motion too please um, can I assume that we're going to do this indefinitely we're not going to vote on it every year right? no so it'll be in place until That's it gets voted okay. out okay. correct okay yep all in favor opposed Jason, under old business, I'd like to have just a brief discussion about gold tees once again. I think I've operated under the assumption that we're talking about doing a golf course at a time. I don't think we need 14 elevated tee boxes for gold tees. I think we need maybe two or three a golf course. And I think we need to get started and we need to do them one, one tee box at a time. I think we just keep putting it off. Like on the country club, I can think of maybe two or three spots where we don't have, what we need is level tee boxes and fair tee boxes. We don't necessarily need elevated tee boxes. There's like three holes on the country club I can think of, maybe two, that need a, tea, a little bit of a tee box. You don't need a lot of help, like on number one. You need to build up in the front so it's a little level because it's severely downhill. Number, number eight is sloped a little bit, but that's true on most all of our golf courses. In addition to that, I think we need T markers. <clears throat> to not put T markers out for gold tees is saying they are less than a regular T. And we need to justify those T boxes a little bit. And half the year we don't pick up those markers because we're not mowing. So I think if you want to make the, the gold tees similar to other tees and legitimize them, you need to have T markers. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I think it's time to get started and do it one tee box at a time. Were the, were the PIFTs uh, improvements taken out of the capital gate budget this year? Mm -hmm. 
So it's been the top of our list for four years, yeah. and we've seen <laughs> absolutely no progress. And I think if we do one T box, that's progress. So Thank I think you. we need to get started. Um, just just as a, a side note to that point, uh, some of you may know or that I've started off with a survey program at, at the request of Jason to find out if we could have golfers who would voluntarily donate a portion of their, their tremendous savings they're going to get for golf this year to do projects that are not in the budget that we all, we all like to do. I mean, I just wrote down three of them as I was speaking, uh, listening to here, is that, you know, doing a, a, a tee box, one tee box, just get it started would be a benefit. Or putting out the, the plates along the path instead of painting the path could be a project that that the volunteer revenue that we could generate could be a project that that could do. So just so you're aware, uh, I started with uh, sending out some surveys to the group leaders and asked them to populate through their groups to see if people would just, what they think of the idea. Not that they're committing to anything, just if we had a program where you could voluntarily donate a dollar for every round you play or a, a one-time hundred dollar or whatever, uh, would, you, would you participate? And if you would participate, if we can get enough groundswell going, we could then formalize a, a group that says, okay, we're going to take a little next, put some meat around it and figure out what we're going to do. But there are projects like what Dean just talked about. There are projects we talked about with the markers, uh, refurbishing the restrooms that need money that are, might not be in the budget to do. And if we could raise, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 doing this program, we could do some of these projects on our own without having to impact the, the budgets. We may have to use a resource or two to help, but at least we can identify some of those programs that we would like to do. We don't, we, we can't, we haven't funded. So just so you're aware, I, I, there will be another notice going on, email going out to all the group leaders uh, asking them to give me their feedback. So far, what I've heard back, and I think Susan's got some verbal feedback from her groups, uh, yeah, they kind of like the idea. Uh, uh, they like to see what kind of projects that we would do. Um, but of the dozen or 15 re responses I've already received, I've got pledges for a thousand, over $1,000 from people saying, yeah, I'll give you 300 bucks, I'll give you 200 bucks. And so I think there is a desire to participate. We just have to you know, get it out, get the word out, and find, get some more feedback. And if it really is something that we should do, or can do, uh, formalize it and put this group together, maybe it's a subcommittee of this group, or maybe it's a volunteer from group leaders, that would help us to find what the program is gonna be, how do we manage it, and so forth, without burdening the staff to do it. I don't want, I wanna make this an ad hoc uh, volunteer program that we can go and participate with the savings that we all are gonna feel that people that play a lot of golf this year are gonna save a lot of money just because of the new rate structure. And I'm willing to give part of my money back. I mean, I, I think that's it's part of my obligation to go do that. And uh, so just be aware that I'm gonna be sending these things out and you may get contacted by your your uh, group leader, but if you, if you don't, maybe you can ask them about it. But Anyway, it's going out, and we're going to try to quantify what the desire is or isn't. If there's, if there's no desire, if I don't get a, a good feedback, then we'll just drop it. But I think programs like what Dean just talked about, and took, you know, things that we talked about for card pass, are, are very doable projects that we could take on and we could do it. So, um, going going back a little bit to what Dean <clears throat> talked about. First of all, I think that the idea of the T markers in the winter is brilliant. Right, when we're not really doing maintenance, you know, mowing the courses, because we also know it's hard to find those markers in the winter, especially. But part of the, what I'm thinking of is we've talked about them for the last four years. They've been pretty, the discussion's been pretty general. Yes, we need them. But I don't know that we've ever really gone to the, the effort, and maybe somebody has, of saying, you know, thinking of it more as a minimalist project rather than an elevated tee box on every tee, that, you know, maybe we, could do a, within the committee, go out, take a look and get a plan for each course and say, you know, this would be a good first step so that when we go to price it, right, because it 
it's likely it won't be until the next budget cycle if it's in the budget. I mean, it won't be, right? Uh, but at least then we're ready to do something instead of to talk about it again. So just a thought. I'd love to pair with David and see what he has to think on some of those things because I think we have a few tee boxes, not very many, maybe two or three that are totally unfair for the gold tee boxes. I'm thinking of one at, at Kingswood, for example. Nobody that plays gold tees can reach that in two. There's like three or four in the village they can't reach. So I'd be interested in David's input, and I think we'd be surprised at how few we're actually talking about on a minimal project, like you say, getting started, making tea boxes that are level and fair. And I, I think that's would be my desire. And Mark, I'm not, I'm not just saying winter, I'm saying all year we need tea boxes. If we're going to treat these teas like the rest of the teas, we need to treat them like the rest of the teas, not half of the year. You know, this could be a, a, a maybe a, an activity that the course uh, assignment could could take up and come back to the committee and just say, here are the T's that we like to do at Dogwood. In Highlands, we could do it at Highlands and, and so forth. So everybody has their own course that they would evaluate and come back and make a recommendation as to how big of a job this is. I like Gary's idea. Let's involve everybody. Question for Keith real quick. And on to Dean's point on getting started on something, what are the what is that what would that look like and just say number one here and I'm just throwing out something but okay, what would what, that look what, like from a maintenance and somewhat of an idea of a cost perspective but I would suggest I like the idea of each person that does a golf course picking theirs and then maybe we pick a couple of them that we want to do and we would do the work try to find a way to do one or two this fall when we don't have, when we have people available that could do projects other than what just the day to day. So maybe we just, maybe we just pick one really key one or two, and then we can see how good a job we do at it. Because the problem with a lot of these tees you're talking about aren't level. We're all done in house, by the way, there's part of the problem. I'm not saying we don't know how to do it, but it's hard to do with minimum crews and get it right. David could probably speak to that on the compaction and all that. But I'm willing, and, and I think it would be a great thing to do, to try to incorporate what you've said about maybe some of the money for it. You'd have time to know. If you give me a T or two you want to do and the size, I can get with David. I'm sure you'll help me. We can pick out the area and the size, and we can, come, we can know what it would cost for the materials to do. And then it's in October, November, December, January and then if you do one and see it works then we might try to put one or two in the actual budget for 21 and I'd be happy to to work with I that. love it that'd be a good start and by the way if you put tea blocks out you won't have to paint the cart path anymore for those gold tees painting the cart path for the gold tees is a heck of a lot easier than getting off that fairway mower every time <laughs> and moving them I'm just telling well you. we get off the fairway mower to pick up or all of our tea boxes, we pick up 10 other tea barkers and we, we pick do, up all those not, return to cart path. Dean, I, I agree with you, yeah. but I'd like you to come out and ride on that fairway more one day and see what it takes to do that. I, we can do anything we need to do and we will try to do that. It is I, just. I saw some young guys one day at uh, working over at Dogwood and took them about 30 seconds to get off and put take those off and off. Off a tea more, They were yes. running all the way. But. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it can be done. I'm not saying it can't be done. When this was originally set up, it was talked about to save time, and that's what we did. When we're ready to change that, then we'll have to talk about it. Well, my whole point is legitimizing those tea boxes. I think more people will go to them when they find out it's a real tea box. It's just like the other tea boxes. Thanks, Dean. And I agree. Chan, did you have? I can give you some. Okay, well, well, we can discuss for sure. Absolutely. Thank you. You good on the gold teasing for now? You good? Good. New business, uh, real quick, because we are over. Um, we need to vote on going back to 4.30 uh, starting in April, and we also are going to have a meeting day time, day change in April as well. Um, so if I could get a motion to move the time starting in April back to 4.30, start time for the meeting. 
I'll second. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed, no. Uh, April time uh, date is going to be the third Wednesday. There's going to be some of us that are going to be out that week of uh, the 11th, so we're going to pump it to the 15th tax day. So everybody will be in a great mood. <laughs> April 15th. Mm -hmm. Make sure. Yeah, I think, uh, so a couple. Yeah, we got to. Yeah, correct. Won't be the 8th. It'll be the 15th. So we, and that'll be after Golf Fest as Golf well. Fest. Yep. So we'll be able to visit on the success, hope, hopefully off Golf Fest. We also have um, a lot more people in town. There's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six people that won't be here that week. That's why we changed it. And down to. Wait, we're going to need to vote on that. Oh, on the change of the day, the 15th? Yes. Yeah, okay. Can I get so a I move that we change the April date, the date of the April meeting to April 15th at 4.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Second. In the afternoon. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no kidding. Less participation as well. <laughs> yes, just, yes, yes, correct. Just, just April. Uh, discussion, no. All in favor? Okay. Course assignments. I take bribes. Five dollars a bribe. <laughs> Who wants what? <laughs> Who wants what? Somebody talked to Phil. Was it you that talked to me? Yeah. You wanted. I like the pilots. I've been very good there. Okay. If I have to believe my beloved dog would, I'll take anything. <laughs> okay, so who said, uh, Mark? Tanner Gary. Dino's Country Club. Do what? Gary has tenured and Burke still. <laughs> uh, who's that? Oh, Kingsman. Mary. Dean. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna keep Brittany Dogwood, right, Susan? Mark, uh, Mark, Brittany Dogwood is Susan. Phil? Kingwood Burks. Man, there's nothing left for me again. I just want to point out something. Um, what's Jason doing? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> I sit in your office. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but anybody else have anything? Announcement, we have Golf Fest, obviously, the 11th uh, from 10 to 3. You have a sign-up sheet before you leave. Put your name down, um, 9 to 12 uh, or 12 to 3. Uh, I think that's everything else. Um, Our next meeting is the 15th. Yeah, real, real quick, uh, starting in a couple of weeks on number two at Dogwood, you'll be able to see our azaleas planted out there. 40 azaleas uh, are going in. So we're hoping for no frost. You're not going to get them to bloom like at the Masters? We're planning on that. No, we're I like planning it. on having them all in bloom for the uh, golf course superintendent's term. It's too warm for the <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Yeah, well, I got one more question. Oh, sorry, Gary's got one more question. From the, from the expo yesterday, do you have any feeling of how many people, other than the, the group leaders that were there? We stopped counting at 270-ish. Really? Yeah. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Oh, we already had one? Well, that's a journey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>